do you uh, uh, can I Okay. Just that's a bit better. I think that's a bit of balance. We have broadcast live. We have people. Hello, people. We have people like that. Hello, um, welcome to the first e seminar of the Culturizing Sustainable Cities project. I'm Nancy Dexbury. I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Studies in at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And this is Dr. Elise Longley from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Hi. Anyway. We're getting feedback. Like, oh, it's from that computer. Okay. Just feedback? Sorry. <laughs> we have many computers set up to make this go, and we seem to be getting feedback from something. I just wanted to begin by saying a few words about the project within which the C seminar is being broadcast. And thank you for joining us. Um, it's entitled Culturizing Sustainable Cities, and it's being funded by the by FCT in Portugal. It's running from 2000, mid 2014 to 2020. Its, its main research question is how can cultural practices be harnessed and embedded within the planning and development of more sustainable cities, which is up there but difficult to see, I notice. Um, it has three sub. Um, Questions, how can cultural activities in urban environments contribute to building more sustainable cities? How can local governments integrate culture within sustainable city planning and related initiatives? And how do these practices, both the cultural activity and the city planning, inform and advance our thinking about the role of culture and sustainable development? And the role of culture in urban planning for more sustainable cities? The project came about in recognition that there's a lot of activity happening, and this isn't showing up that well. Lights off. Like, oh, that's it's this one. Sorry, it's the window. Too much natural light, which is a problem. It's that one. That's it's the window actually. If we really all practice by the time Elise gets up here. Um, that there's a great diversity of uh, uh, activities happening internationally about um, linking culture and sustainable development. There's an array of multidisciplinary research and transdisciplinary work being done um, across the world. There's a lot of planning and policy initiatives being taken at levels from local to international. And there's a lot of artistic and social experimentation, artworks, projects, um, pilots and programs, and they're not necessarily connecting with one another. So this project is has been created as a research project, but also a bridging project, and aims to connect the knowledge and and um, practice based experiences from um, both the artistic world and the planning and policy world. It's informed by many different fields from community arts, urban sustainability, culture, nature, relations, experimental arts, citizen engagement, and cultural planning and policy. It also takes out of its face um, a conviction that artistic activities and interventions have an important part in shaping and informing the, the cities that we are creating. So that they can, as um, for instance, we know that they can provide new ways of perceiving and inquiring about the world, provoking and fostering changes in thinking, acting and living together. They can activate public engagement, catalyze social relations, and evolve new ways of working and living. 
and they can physically and symbolically change the spaces in which we live and create, fostering greater connections with our natural and built environments. This Culturizing and Sustainable Cities project has a website. It's uh, www.sejuc.pt, Project Builds Culturizing. In, in, in process now are a series of, of case studies internationally of giving examples of the types of artistic and planning projects I've mentioned. Um, there's a research, so it's International Research Associates Network that's been created, the list of those members are on the website. And uh, it will also be um, organizing e-seminars later on, the summer school conference and more. So, finally, I'm thrilled to present uh, Dr. Lisa Longley, who's the featured guest of our first e-seminar for this project, who is a visiting researcher at SEJ now, and is, I uh, want to reach your bio really quickly. Elise Longley is a performance maker, researcher, and teacher. She is a senior lecturer in the Dance Studies program at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Elisa's research interests include practice-based research, interdisciplinary projects, creative writing, somatic practices, cultural mapping, ecology, and inclusive dance education. She is leading the project Fluid City, an art science education project on water sustainability, and her artist book, The Foreign Language of Motion, presents a series of which presents a series of experiments in choreographic writing was published in 2014 with Winchester University Press's preface series. So um, I should, her, her seminar today is entitled Communicating Water Sustainability Through Interdisciplinary Creative Practice, The Fluid City Project, Auckland, New Zealand. For those viewers, those viewers out there, if you have any questions for, for Elise while she's speaking or now, um, please email and I don't know how readable this is. So it's Duxbury, D-U-X-B-U-R-Y, at C-E-S dot U-C dot P-T. And I will be monitoring email during the presentation and we'll include your questions with others of those attending today. And we also would like, this is optional, but if you are watching this broadcast, we would love to hear from you, same email address, um, at the end of the broadcast, just to let us know where you're listening from. Thank you. So without further ado, pass it over to Elise. And just a minute, we will do this quickly. This can be, this can be closed, and this can be launched. Launched. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it's a thrill to be in Portugal from New Zealand, so I imagine, you know, here in Portugal, and if I buried down through the centre of the world, I'd come out in my home country. So we're really bridging the world with this project, and that really is a thrilling thing for me. The city of Auckland in New Zealand is surrounded by sea. Its suburbs are streaked with rivers. Water is a defining environmental and cultural element of life in Auckland City, one that's becoming increasingly both prized and threatened due to issues of global warming and um, urban overuse. It's this environmental context that frames the research project Fluid City. It's an art science education project in which public art communicates important water sustainability issues for diverse general publics. And our project brings together scientists, artists, architects, educators, geographers, um, and a range of different researchers, both specialists in like microbiology, geomorphology, um, sort of hard sciences, through to post-structuralists, social researchers, um, poets, dancers. So it's a really wide range of different um, researchers, all of us based through the University of Auckland. In 2012, 
The project was staged in a high-density urban area on Auckland's waterfront. In 2014, we worked with a secondary school, James Cook High School, um, in South Auckland over four months to co-create with the students a new version of the project for the local community. Attempts to map and document the project are generating innovative approaches to social sciences methodology, bringing together research practices drawn from both artistic and qualitative research techniques. So the artistic techniques we're using poetic inquiry, dance, improvisation practice, choreography, site-specific dance, we're also looking at qualitative research techniques like ethnography, narrative research, poetic research, cultural mapping. Um, we're looking at philosophies of the more than human to post-humanist, the new materialisms. Um, and we're looking at case studies. We're looking at more kind of social sciences structures where we do case studies or action research um, to try it. So we're framing the project in different ways depending on the disciplinary focus. But our disciplinary focus is quite flexible. It's fluid and it moves depending on which one of us is leading the writing and what kind of information we want people to know. Do we want people to really have um, a felt, embodied experience? Um, are they um, members of the community who haven't got experience reading research? Or are we writing for social scientists? Or are we writing for architects? So depending on who we want to communicate with, we try to aim to communicate the project from both really specialised technical language to the, to the language, a language in which um, someone from any age group or any background will be able to take away the key information that we're trying to share. Or the key ideas or senses that we want people to feel, because water, it can be something that is felt, or it can be something that is um, written about in a highly technical. The tactics our research team are employing to evoke engagement around complex and multi-layered environmental issues involve facilitating spaces of curiosity, play, wonder, optimism, and active engagement. Our research team are asking, how might creative, practice-led, and qualitative research methods interweave to generate strategies for communicating documenting and analysing research on pressing issues of environmental sustainability. So the project has had um, different iterations. Um, the first one was in 2012. Last year we had one in October 2014. We did a kind of artist-led um, version of the project for um, um, an artist residency in February this year. So um, I'm not able to talk about every element of the project and all its different politics, but I'll just give you a brief overview of the first iteration of the Women Quarter. So the project has a series of vessels. This is the um, Wandering Laboratory. It's a science lab with test tubes of water from um, across Auckland City. So people can come up and ask to test water. They choose somewhere that's meaningful to them in the city. So I come from Halleck, so I might say, and I'd like to test water in how there's a there's a, um, a test tube from Pakaraya. I can look at the water, I can look at the live sample under the microscope, I can find out what's alive in the water and what that means in terms of stream health. So and in Auckland we have a very diverse um, range of different well wellness in our waters. <laughs> it's terrible English. Um, we have water that's very badly polluted and by industry and is really quite dangerous for human health and we have pristine waterways. So some of our um, samples are extremely pristine and you can see all the indicators in the water when you look through the microscope with the microbiologist to tell you, okay, this is why, this is what this means for us as humans and this is what means for the indigenous fish species, this is what means in, for the um, environment around the community. And then you might compare, say, in the west of Auckland, you can, we have pristine streams and then you go, 15 kilometers down river and the water is really polluted because in an area called Henderson there's a lot of industry and so we can talk about how in concrete terms the water is being affected by us, by urbanization, by the city through this laboratory and then what I really like about it is that we've had kids as young as, you know, really young two-year-old kids held up by their parents looking through and we've had grandparents so really any age group can engage with the, with the lab um, and think about the well-being of their waterway. We've then got 
There's the map that people can choose. We have um, postcards, so we have the vessel of stories. Um, so there's, this one says, what do you think are the important water issues for Auckland? And this one says, share a water story or poem or thought or idea or memory or drawing or map. So here we have kind of like tangible issues that people might be concerned by. And here we're looking more at the intangible. We're looking at um, other meanings of water other than necessarily the issues. We can look at memories. We can look at how water enhances our sense of, our, of place and of relationships. And we gathered all these together and created a washing line of stories and issues. We have the Roaming Cinema as our next vessel. Um, and it, it, we made with um, artist James Hutchinson a uh, film, which has animated and photographed images and clips and fragments um, of different understandings of water in the city. And a little example of that I'll show you in a second. And we have the vessel of stories where people can listen to stories from the very scientific, from a planning, architectural, from cultural. We have stories and poems and children remembering their memories of waterways close to here. So it's bringing together different values and different meanings of water from locals that people can then listen to. The idea is that we work as a repository and a vessel so we can take in different stories of water and we can share them with people and then we can travel them and then meet with new people, gather in new meanings of water, and then share them. So it always, the project keeps getting bigger and changing as we go to different places. Yes, just a couple more images. Uh, this is the site-specific dance piece made by Carol Brown, choreographer Carol Brown, the first version of the project. Working from the paradigm of the modern than human, the Fluid City researchers are asking how can we give voice to water in all of its vulnerability and necessity? How can we place liquid perception at the centre of our methodology? And so today I'd like to present a series of attempts to discuss ways in which qualitative researchers from diverse backgrounds or artists or creative practice researchers or cultural mappers um, might move beyond language-bound methods such as interviews and field notes to include techniques for cultural mapping, listening, drawing, and attending to place and environment through practices drawn from fine arts, geography, site-specific dance, photography and film, and creative writing. The interdisciplinary collaborative research I'll discuss has the aim to present ecological thinking across disciplinary borders, to merge spaces between information and imagination, to give voice to life forms beyond our own. So I have a short clip documenting the Fluid City project at James Cook High School in October, this, um, October 2014. It was filmed and edited by artist James Hutchinson. Um, this version of Fluid City was co-created with two senior students from the school, John DeLosa and Caitlin Christie, who wrote the poems that make up the soundtrack to the film. The poems were composed during a site-specific workshop that engaged with various waterways near their school in response to specific writing tasks given by writer and educator Sasha Matthewman. John and Caitlin also worked closely with film and animation maker James Hutchinson, photographing and filming the landscapes around their community, in micro looking really close at the details of the environment, and macro looking at the relationship between things. With they worked with sustainability researcher Charlotte Schunder and with geographer Karen Fisher discussing the ecology of specific places in their local environment. A research question that we bring to our secondary school work is, how can educators address the cultural context of students' life worlds in order to make emotional connections with their local and global environment? So I'll just play this short video. I'll just start this again so we can hear the sound. It's sort of cut it off. It's sort of It's on that. Oh, this is music. So 
Sorry, we've just had a glitch. I'm not sure what happened there. It's turned on music. Just one second. Why is it? Well, I think we should just play it through the laptop because okay. it'll just be easier. We have surround sound, but the surround sound is like waves slow. We all flow like rivers in the shivers that stream up. That's fine. This is life. We are the water circle. We live to live like waves were crashing against the rocks. So we are like the ice that melts against the light. We chase spaces of war cycle and I try to move the beauty from standing to hills, from sea to sky. This is life. The water that moves within the ocean. We try to close this hole and not stop this hole. We are the mist, ubiquitous and ethereal, felt in my breath, and it's to cool. We are the clouds moving without care or emotion. Walking the bright lights to shed sorrow where it is needed. I feel it here in the hour of the door circuit. This is why. My words grow to light like waves fly. We will flow like rivers and shivers that shoot up our swans. We move in shape of places like tea in a cup, liquids and bottles. Shapeless and forms yet shaped with the beauty of blue and warm to see the fish. So we live with this with anger gets together. The ocean is beside the smurfs, the birds, the tables, the wonder, the joy, streams, the minds are tripping through the forest earth. The water flows blasting the water, the blissful sound of the ground, the ground, the place of water travel, the water chasing its tail, the place of the water sites, the place of the sun. Everything is moving in the direction of its own decision. The flow is by now, but the freedom. The colour is not as it appears, the surrounding water is not my own perception. To me, it is a reflection of the cycle of things. Of things once in its original state and of how things do become. My perception of the water that flows is that life does not always come, but still continues. Though the storm may come, the wind powerfully being the water, there will be a time when things will come, and all will be still. I'll just talk and have the film going behind me. So, for those of you that don't have a very good um, image on your computers, you can you can sort of just see it happening in the background. So, in the Fluid City project, we worked with around 150 students to look at water issues through different investigatory modes, through metaphor and imagery, through studying patterns via camera lenses, through looking at and making maps that help us. Think about where our drinking water comes from and how dependent on it we are. Through movement, choreographing water structures and considering the effect on our bodies in space and time. Creating practice, co-creation and imagination are key to our project. Our thinking in terms of sustainability research is that we need tools or maps that enable the possibility of imagining our futures with an ecological focus. So I'm considering different artistic practices and their artistic outcomes as forms of maps. That is, ways to see and understand our world in micro and macro through different perspectives, scales, senses, and values. Mapping can be considered a colonizing territorial practice, yet it can also be a way of undoing languages of territory and privatization. Maps can articulate minor worlds as well as major ones they can articulate ways of understanding cities that provide alternatives to the majoritarian, neoliberal assumptions embedded in so many city plans and political framings of the work of place. I am thinking of maps that might enable a gentling of space and recognise diverse conceptualisations of value to allow intangible values, such as belonging or holistic well-being, and space for contemplation or adventure, or even adventurous contemplation. Dennis Books, sorry, Dennis Wood's book, Everything Sings. Oh, here's James Cook High School, sorry. Mr. Slide. So, Dennis Wood's book, Everything Sings, Maps for a Narrative Atlas, takes, as Ira Glass puts it in his board to the book, a form that's not intended for feeling or mystery and makes it breathe with human life. 
Wood maps the poetic effects of one neighbourhood. He maps light and shade. He maps smell and soundscape. Wind chime, sound of wind chimes. Um, he maps holiday decorations. He maps the roots of rubbish collection and postal delivery as intimate choreographies between people and for people. He maps the rhythmic interfaces between events and how they are experienced. He maps the life and texture of a particular place. He maps the ecological relationships between landscapes and life forms, and all this somehow makes our world seem very fragile and very precious, as Ira Glass puts it. And in her book, Vibrant Matter, philosopher Jane Bennett discusses what she calls a countercultural kind of perceiving. In her discussion of the vitality of matter, Bennett proposes that we recognise our interconnectedness with not only living creatures, but with the objects which co-constitute the assemblages that are ourselves. So she writes, by vitality I mean the capacity of things, edibles, commodities, storms, metals, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities or tendencies of their own. And Halosian, historian and philosopher and artist Paul Carter's book, Dark Writing, discusses the importance of including non-linear logics in mapping practices. He writes that it doesn't matter how maps are redrawn unless they are drawn differently. And I've taken Carter's point as a provocation over the last year. I've experimented with different kinds of drawing differently, writing differently, and attending differently within the way I documented things through the Fluid City Project. Each of these experiments has emerged out of an intention to create a deep map or a different map or of a felt relationship to space, time, sense and fluidity. I've been considering dance, improvisation scores and choreographic works as spatial maps that trace responsiveness to specific places and specific moments. Um, I'd like to read out a section from a publicity statement for their current dance work, Closer, by US choreographers um, Olive Beringer and Otto Ramstead. They write, After years of making dance in public space, kinesthetic empathy, the ability to experience empathy by observing the movements of another human being, has become for us an important political and choreographic strategy to pursue aliveness. Dancing in public space where the body is often viewed as a commodity and restricted to sitting, standing and walking is a form of free speech. We believe that dance is the ultimate form of expression for our current era because of its intentional liveness, its rejection of didacticism and its invitation for reflection and inquiry. It is absolutely ephemeral, yet invites us to feel ourselves, our bodies, in the present and brings us into relationship with the world and others who inhabit this world. By moving, we transform the way we sense, the way we feel, and the way we think. I love that idea, and I think it's really true. By moving, we transform the way we, the way we sense, the way we feel, and the way we think. So, um, Olive and Otto's company, Body Cartography, has a really rich website, so I'd really encourage anyone to have a look at their website for more examples of looking at the relationship between people and environment and each other, um, and how do we can connect with the more than human through the body, and they have many examples of that really beautifully documented on their website. Um, I think it's just like www.bodycartography.com. You find their work easily. We can add some of the references that you're mentioning on the YouTube page under comments. Okay. So the reference. Yeah, we'll put, but that's just in case you didn't hear, we'll add references. Um, and links after this online. So I'm thinking about um, the potentials of dance as a means to connect with and understand our place in the world. I think dance and embodied practice gives potential for, potential for understanding and documenting the coextensiveness between bodies, cities, and waterways. And a real tool that we're offered comes to us, the tools are available to us all the time. The modalities of embodied perception allow us sensing with and into different worlds in which we live. Our embodied perception allows relationships with other species, 
objects and people. Our embodied perception allows recognition of our placement within an ecological system and to act with awareness, and it allows for us to act with awareness of this perception. Our bodies, which are 60 to 70 percent water, and which have the same saline content as the sea, are a kind of apparatus through which we can think with our worlds, with humans, with landscapes, with other species, with forms of plant life, well, with all kinds of vibrant matter. Also, the style through which we form sentences and three concepts to the page is part of a conceptual ecology that frames interactions and events. So following um, Gregory Bateson's book, um, you know, Sets to an Ecology of Mind, ecologies consider the interrelationship of material and conceptual forms wherein all elements of an ecology impact on all others. And as such, the style or form through which ideas move such as the way that I'm delivering this presentation, it could be considered to have ecological impact in terms of the travel of affects and the modes of, of thinking and politics that they engender. So Deleuze coined the term liquid perception in his first book of cinema and philosophy, here we are, as a perception that no longer has the solid as an object, condition, or milieu. And a Deleuzean undercurrent of all of my work in the Fluid City Project over all these years has looked at um, formal style as a materialization of thinking. And so another Deleuze book. One's always writing to bring something to life, to free life from where it's trapped, to trace lines of flight. The language for doing this can't be a homogenous system. It's something unstable, always heterogeneous, in which style carves differences of potential between which things can pass, come to pass. A spark can flash and break out of language itself. And I guess where I'm going with this paper is that we're looking for sparks to flash out of language itself in order to create space for a thinking differently in terms of how um, in each of our different environments and assemblages of living, we can allow space for thinking differently about our relationship to our environment and our ecology. So how do we create these flashes of life or flashes of style or flashes of space to get people to just shift their thinking to allow more space for the more than human or for the ecology in all sorts of different ways that they relate to their daily life and daily practices. So I'm wondering, is it possible for me to present my work in such a way that our attention becomes fluid and values fluids? It's a performative question. <laughs> Um, in writing and presenting towards states of liquid effect, a seminar or a presentation might become a performance, an experiment with embodiment and with writing, and it might allow enabling disruptions. It might create space for, as the ethnographers Alison Fitz and Leslie Saunders put it, a gentling of space. Their article, um, The Sounds of Violence, The Ethnographic Potency of Poetry, conveys the importance of poetry in forming alternatives to what they term as a militaristic trend in the language of research methodology. So for them, style is incredibly important in allowing space for thinking in new ways. They write that this isn't poetry for poetry's sake. This isn't poetry as therapy in this context. This is poetry for thinking in new shapes and sounds of those things we half know in poetry. This is poetry for the sake of deepening the space where violence is writ large and ugly. Where violence is writ large and ugly. And so for me, I'm thinking about environmental violence. And I think um, Fitz and Saunders are talking about urban, they write a lot about migration and the rights of refugees. So for, I think their context is largely to do with human rights and within cities and spaces. Um, but I, in particular in relation to the Fluid City Project, the violence that I see is in like, the waterways in my city and in my country and in other countries as well. Um, the rights of people to have access to clean and fresh water. And you can see a lot of violence in everyday practices around water all around the world. So to me, I guess I'm trying to make connections between the politics of how we write and the politics of actions, concrete actions that are happening in our landscapes. Fitz and Saunders describe the grammar through which their ethnographic texts are written as neither structure nor anti-structure, but working away with words and their spaces to embrace in the sense of gathering in and in the sense of loving the, fragil the fragility and messiness of worlds, half known 
misknown, but attempted, nonetheless attempted. <laughs> the challenge of moving crucial sustainability research from the university, the lab and the workshop into the public realm is well documented. One way of translating ecological thinking in terms of the ways our cities and communities function is through cultural engagement, such as art events and educational spaces. So Nancy Duxbury here is a social scientist who researches relationships between art and culture. And Nancy writes, Artistic and sociocultural activities have transformative power to build and change the meanings of the city. Relations with the urban territory and connections with each other. Cultural artifacts, activities, and narratives can recover, create, and embody the symbolic resources and marginalized wisdom that individuals need to navigate the world around them and potentially become change agents for more sustainable living and urban development practices. So Fluid City is part of one of the case studies for Nancy's Culturalizing Sustainable Cities project. And our vision is very much in line with hers in terms of the importance of work that exists at the level of culture in presenting navigations of our world that value sustainable living. However, on the ground, creating the Fluid City project, oh, I'll put a of Fluid City up. Um, it feels very much like sticking, a, it feels very much like a tiny attempt, an attempt to put an infinitesimally small sticking plaster on an enormous cultural and environmental wound. It's common knowledge in my home of New Zealand, that nationally our waterways are in a perilous state. Something like 74% of our indigenous um, fish species are endangered. Internationally, anthropologist Veronica Strang writes of how the politics of water ownership are potentially the most divisive international political issue we have facing our species, that nothing mm -hmm. on earth, not even land, is more contested. And yet, the ecological relationships that contextualize our lives and that we depend on are largely invisible to most of us. It's like the parable written by author David Foster Wallace that I'd like to paraphrase. So two young goldfish are swimming around in their goldfish bowl. An older goldfish swims past in the opposite direction and says, evening boys, how's the water? Boys nod and smile at the old goldfish swims away. Eventually, one of the young fish turns to the other and says, what's water? Many of us can't see the ecological relationships surrounding us because they're so taken for granted. We can't see the water in which we live. So how do we get diverse communities in our cities to value water, which is so crucial to our survival and considered by many scientists to be in a state of crisis due to issues of population and so population growth and pollution? So our proposition at Fluid City Project is that the arts can help us to see in new ways. To imagine things that can't be seen by the naked eye and to help make visible connections between seemingly distant things. And I know Fluid City is not alone with the same. There's lots of projects and I think that's why um, Nancy's work is so important because she's allowing lots of these projects to connect with each other and to share tools and understanding internationally. New Zealand psychologist Nikki Hare emphasizes the need for sustainability work to capture the imagination, to be dynamic, playful, and lively. She emphasizes that the way in which science is translated from specialized to everyday language, and the way that the implications of environmental research are communicated, have significant implications on whether or not communities respond optimistically and productively to environmental challenges. Artist and academic Baz Kershaw has made a substantial contribution to research around environmental sustainability and performance methodology. His articulation of biotic rights I'll just to find it, advocates for the rights of all living species and considers humans an animal of no more importance than any other among many biotic forms. Kershaw goes so far as to engage in a thought experiment wherein we take on the point of view of non-human species made endangered by human carbon emission and greed. And from this point of view, the concept of human rights is seen as yet another sick joke of modernism and postmodernism gone wrong, or perhaps, case Gregory Bateson, a profoundly paradoxical kind of insanity. So that's a pretty big jump, isn't it, to say that the notion of human rights is insane. 
But the point here isn't to say that human rights are not worth considering, but that they need to be greatly extended. That our very survival as a species depends on our recognition of ecologies beyond the human. So what's interesting to me about all of this is how the spaces between the actual and the imagined, the conceptual and the pragmatic, between information and behaviour, flow across and into each other. And I'm really interested in how researchers from all disciplines might begin to research from a more than human point of view. This is because we're coextensive with our environment. We depend on it and it forms us. We're part of the natural world in terms of our basic existence, such as our need for fresh, clean air, water, food, and habitable weather. And yet, so much research that I read is human-centric. It's anthropocentric. The limits of academic language also seem to limit our ability to articulate the complex ecologies in which we live. So, in a 2013 provocation piece in the journal Environmental Humanities, Tom Greaves raises some important questions around how the arts and sciences, sciences both natural and social, might work together in making environmental perspectives tangible to diverse communities. He writes that we live together in a world with myriad creatures that are far from human, and the world that we live in is a far more than human world. Central to his argument is that we abandon the name humanities altogether, as this reinforces an anthropocentric worldview. Bruce points out instead that universities be divided into the arts and sciences, and he writes that the faculty of sciences would be a faculty of both natural and social sciences working together or in tandem. So some social scientists might be persuaded that they are in fact social artists and critics. Of course, there should be far more truck between the arts and the sciences, and there currently is, between the humanities and natural sciences, but this should not lead us to confuse their two fundamentally distinct projects. He writes that the arts are at once critical and creative. Their primary purpose is not to disseminate the scientific worldview in an appealing language that is easily understood without a great deal of effort. They are not about propagating preformed worldviews at all, whether they be scientific, counter scientific, or anti scientific. The purpose of the environmental arts is the creative experience and articulation of our ways of being in the more than human world, which involves the expansion, criticism, and occasional shattering of worldviews. So I'm an artist researcher interested in methods for making tangible our coexistence with our environment. Greaves' position, oh, sorry, Greaves' proposition of dismissing the term humanities and instead adopting a field of the environmental arts is really persuasive to me as I think the only way in which we might actively shift our attention, our values, our planning, our everyday practices to consider how they enable ecological well-being is by shifting our languaging and our attention and our points of view well beyond the human. So the idea of a faculty of humanities really does seem a bit tired, but a faculty of the more than humanities seems a little bit improbable. The term arts, on the other hand, is open enough to hold what is currently operating under the title of humanities and is much more biologically open-minded. So how might I, as both a creative artist leading a project like Fluid City and a qualitative researcher documenting and reflecting on it from an ethnographic point of view, integrate the point of view of the environmental arts into my work? My training as a theatre practitioner, a dancer, a writer and a fledgling, fledgling visual artist offers an abundance of tools for applying new materialist philosophy to research practice on the ground. Because we sense our environment through our bodies, we feel weather with the organ of our skin, we sense traces through our nose, we visually understand space and landscape in detail, we hear place echo through distance and proximity, we feel emotional, affective responses which often we can hardly put into words. There's a sense of place that creative methods can make alive in ways that academic words, or sometimes any words at all, cannot. Which brings me back to mapping. My research through the Fluid City exists through photography, documentary and animated film, poetry, sound recording, 
ethnographic journaling, workshop designs, maps, choreography, fleeting drawings, lists, and sentences written on postcards by the public and by students, uh, drawings, and artworks. These artistic methods allow space for the evocation of meaning at the edge of linguistic sense. They allow space for affect and presence, for space and place, for a becoming fluid of communication. It's in such spaces that John DeLose's integral message might translate from a beach in Manurewa in South Auckland to the minds of his peers at James Cook High School and even to you here in Portugal and who knows where else around the world. Um, so I'd like to finish by rereading um, John DeLose's poem as I think it's a provocative response to our research questions which include how can we give voice to water in all of its vulnerability and necessity? How can we place liquid perception at the centre of our methodology? And how might we present ecological thinking across disciplinary borders, merging spaces between information and imagination to value the importance of life forms beyond our own? So John is year 12 student, so he's 17 years old. It's like um, 17, he'll finish, he's got one more year of school after this, and then he'll finish at the old university. He's from one of the least privileged schools in New Zealand. And I think his voice is much more powerful than mine or any member of our, the academic ones from our research team in communicating the communi the, through the complexity of everyday life our interdependence with our waterways. He's the next generation and I think he's got a lot to say. He writes, My words rip tides like waves fly. We all flow like rivers and shivers that stream up our spines. This is life. We are the water cycle. We live with a movement like waves forever crashing against rocks. Stop. We are like the ice that melts against the light we chase. Pace is a water cycle and like rifles we bloom from stem to petals, from sea to sky. This is life. The water that moves within the ocean, we try and oppose this, but we cannot stop this movement. We are the mist, ubiquitous and ethereal, Gods among earth, yet ants to a boot. We are the clouds, moving without care or emotions and blocking the bright lights to shed sorrow where it is needed. We feel defeated. We are the water cycle. This is life. So that's my seminar. That's just a section of John's poem. It's actually three times longer than that. It's a great piece of writing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Elise. There we are. I just wanted a few. Um, thank you. First, I want to thank you very much for bringing the camera. Okay. For launching our e seminar series <laughs> of the Culturized and Sustainable Cities and to exemplify why there are many different knowledges and experiences that have to be brought to bear on this important question, not just the, I guess, hard sciences mm -hmm. and labs. And just to mention that this uh, video has been produced at the Centre for Social Studies at the University of Vibra in Portugal. And that we will be adding the references and the websites that you mentioned onto the comments block under the video online so that um, you can catch them. I have my videos. <laughs> and for those that are out there viewing, if you have any questions for Elise at this time, you can send an email to uh, Duxbury, D-U-X-B-U-R-Y, at ces.uc.pt. And we'll be monitoring for the next little while. Mm -hmm. And if any questions come in afterward, we'll go around to Elise as well. And questions in this audience? <laughs> That's an amazing work. Well, <laughs> I really felt like a very complete and integral work um, in every sense. So it's, it's another paradigm. Mm. Yeah, it's the other way of doing science. So. <laughs> And Paulo. Um, Paulo has run, um, directed a research project here looking at the relationship of the city with uh, the Mondego River, ah. along with other cities with 
rivers, but I believe most of the work was not done like this. <laughs> no. <laughs> As I know this. Like <laughs> different. Very interesting. I'm, I'm, I know myself interested in visual methodologies and working with visual methodologies. So, as I understood, we have something in common in our interests. Well. Yeah. Um, because I'm also, I, I want to know to make the thing with visual methodologies. Social network analysis. That's what I try to do now. But I still I I, I still interested in studying water, rivers and the, mainly the relations between the communities and rivers. To understand rivers as a whole and not only as a part of you know as a course of water that we can see it here and uh, you can see it there, and you must understand it as a wall. And uh, a it's, wall. Yeah, it's, it's very. It's something hard to understand in Europe because uh, usually we we can think rivers when we when we are capable of seeing it yeah, as yeah. a landscape, uh -huh. and, uh, not, uh, and not as we should do it uh, as other than completely different thing. And, and mm -hmm. I'm now interested in promoting this this kind of use and that's why I'm interested in working with the other ways of mapping the rivers and mapping the relationships between communities and rivers. Mm -hmm. So that I I look to your seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's lots of interesting questions yeah. when you start to use visual um, oh, and I can always give you a copy of the writing. Um, like, it, it's very helpful to have a professional photographer, somebody who, because I was talking um, with Pedro Posada from the Department of Architecture about this, that having a photographer, they're trained for all those years to read light. So you're actually communicating through the language of light. And the, every everything, when you work through an artistic medium, everything counts so there might be like the thing that you photographed but the shade of the thing that you photographed you know there's the idea of what you're photographing but then how is the light reading how is how are you using perspective how are you using framing what do, paper are you printing on what camera are you using what kind of um, focus you know all of those things so it's really interesting when you start working at the through the artistic lens at the detail of the materiality of the practice Mm -hmm. um, and you, you develop another register of um, technique and skill in the same way that an ethnographer trains to be able to listen and attend to communities and be able to write up field notes and organize them and analyze things. Um, somebody who works through photography has this ability to be able to read light and space and dimension and they're thinking about the whole history of art and framing and all of these things make kind of stylistic and polit political um, message, messages or meanings. So there's lots of different levels at which you can use the visual. And I mean, sometimes you, you know, like if it was just me and I was taking photographs, I'd bring whatever experience I have and that that is what the research has. But if you can bring a professional photographer who's really experienced, I find that's, that can really enrich the research. So I'm, I feel like Fluid City owes more to James Hutchinson, who's been our documentary. He's documented at least three iterations of the work. Um, he's edited, we've made maybe four films through the work, and he's edited each one. And his eye has actually created um, the visual language of the project. And that visual language is important in ways that are hard to um, quantify. You know, like when we present at seminars, having photographs that are very carefully taken makes a real difference in how people understand. Like Sandra said, you know, the project seems really well realized, and maybe the only reason that it seems well realized is because of James, because the photographs really tell the story, and he knows how to catch the story, because he's edited a lot of, like he's made short films, and he's worked on feature films, and he's worked on ads, and actually ad advertising is the art of, um, taking something kind of complex and making it 
meaningful really quickly to, to a large number of people. And so that's a real skill to be able to kind of condense rich experience into something that communicates clearly. And same working uh, um, the architect on the project, Kathy Wagcorn, who created you can I can show you the images but these um, public art installations. So Kathy, like the pro in a kind of um, functional level, they're really carefully thought through, but Kathy worked really carefully to think about how to make these um, installations <laughs> inviting so that somebody who was just walking past wouldn't feel excluded by them or wouldn't feel that they were so strange that they felt that they weren't something that they, you know, that people just walk past. How to make something kind of inviting at the level where you'd go, oh, it's inviting and I think I'll have a look. Oh, and I'm drawn in. And it's a real, it's such a, um, it's a, hard, again, hard to quantify that feeling of invitation, but, but it takes a lot of testing um, to get something, you know, to, it's about what you don't include. It's about making sure that there's not too many accidental barriers around things, which means that, like, if you want cables, like, if you want to hook something into electricity, or, you know, you have to be really careful about where you put all those little material things, because if there's, like, an accidental barrier, then you lose your connection to the community. It's really interesting. Mm. In, in that context, we, we, we done a traditional research project, but we also work with a um, professional photographer. Mm. He, he died to the river, and uh, we organized an exhibition with uh, mm. some kind of um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that bank of the, the river. And uh, we try to show and to explain the relationship. We call it the the, the, the river sense. So we try to explain the, the relation between the raw materials of the, the river, the sense of the river, and the, the traditional construction systems. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, houses are very different. Uh, traditional houses mm -hmm. are very different here or in the mountains, but mm. it's always the river that is present mm. in, in, this, in this transformation of the traditional the buildings and, the, the, and we show it to, we show it to him working with a, a photographer mm. and uh, making an exhibition it was very interesting. Mm. Yeah, so we have a lot of parallels between research and practice. I'm curious about the functioning of the group of the team. Can you say anything about the following? <laughs> a lot. Um, but so, yeah, Sandra asked um, the functioning of the team. Um, there's just so much that you can say. <laughs> like, um, and we've had a lot of different team members, but I would say it's surprising about how much tension comes into the team because of the performance. I think a lot of it is because of, well, the interdisciplinarity and the performativity. So because we've been working to type time schedules, our funding, both times that we did like major iterations of the project, we had tight the funding you had like a year to use up all your funding. So that means um, you you know, and you don't know if you're going to get the funding, so you have to wait till you've got in the funding before you can contact the school. And so everything and then you've got to, you know, connect with the school, organise it with them, put it into their schedule, and then do the kind of preparatory work and then put up the thing. And um, so learning to speak across languages where everyone feels that they have power when you've got a really um, strong, like a, a really specific material outcome, imagine like a you know performance in a public space where a lot of people are going to be looking at the work. It just creates so much kind of pressure that in each of our disciplines work through that really differently. And so I still feel um, every time we've worked really strongly as a community of researchers to a point, and then it gets really difficult coming up to the performance, and then um, we have to to work really carefully to make sure everybody's voice is heard in the articulation of the project. So it's way more chat every time, like uh, the first time it was very challenging working together because we were working um, across so many disciplines and we had like a geomorphologist and a microbiologist. So they're scientists, one's from the School of Microbiology and one's from the School of the Environment. So they're working quite differently because environment is closer to human geography and microbiology is really lab 
you know, in the laboratory. Um, so they're really different faculty, you know, different departments within science. And then we had architecture, we had two dancers, we had a designer, we had someone from education. And I know the person from education felt that their voice wasn't heard because they were really asking, they were asking questions about um, sort of intangible things about learning and community. And because the artists had to make a thing, like they had to choose the colour of the buckets, <laughs> then we'd have these conversations about material things that seemed more important than the questions that the educator was asking. But in the big picture, the questions that the educator was asking were really important questions. But because we had to make these sculptures and we had to make decisions about things, it becomes like whose voice gets heard becomes a really um, difficult question in a way. And so in a way, I think having way more time would be, um, would be ideal, but I think that never happens, right? So um, the other thing is that having a, maybe having a smaller team, but then you lose the disciplinary richness, and I would never take the disciplinary richness away. So I would say for myself, um, just that tension is just something that you understand and try to manage and try to look after people in a really human, like just checking in with everyone at the beginning of every, of every meeting and allowing meeting, like another problem with this kind of team is ambition. People get really ambitious and they have a real stake in the project. And um, if there's a lot of things that you want to get done done every meeting, there's like a really packed agenda. And so having a jet, like allowing yourself, because I was the leader both on both times, in the second version, the one in the school, I was the only leader. And I think, now I think, hmm, if I just let us only get to like point two on the agenda and like let the other things fall off the agenda for the sake of everybody feeling better, you know, rather than trying to race through the agenda and cutting people off. Like really simple management um, things become really important, I think. So it's really interesting that thing between compromise and achievement and balance, learning how to balance that. Mm -hmm. But having done like now three iterations of the project, um, and every time I've been emotionally exhausted at the end, and most of the research team has too, I think. Um, but every time we felt that we achieved something that we, you know, we felt like we were, you know, maybe things that are important aren't easy and it's not supposed to be easy. You shouldn't expect it to be like really enjoyable all the time. So maybe it's changing your expectations to think that feelings of failure, feelings of difficulty, feelings of unease, feelings of tension, they're actually really important, useful feelings and they're part of generating innovative work. Maybe that's part of it too. Like I really have huge respect for all of my research teams. So I don't think that it's that we are like difficult or, um, um, you know, like that we have problems. I think the problem is that we're so committed that we put so much care in and so we've got really high stakes. And so that's where the tension, because different people want to get different things out, but we all want to get something out from our own disciplinary perspective. <laughs> Is that, I just also, you know, I think it's important that we talk about unease and difficulty in our research, and we don't only talk about, um, you know, the really enjoyable, like smooth parts of research, because um, I think learning how to deal with these teams and being open about the fact that it's a really challenging on a personal, psychological, and emotional level, as well as a creative level. I think that's part of part of the work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? I was just going to mention, we have an email mm -hmm. question. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> From Canada. Uh, the question is, to what extent was your project influenced by Maori beliefs and practices about our relationship to the environment? What an excellent question. <laughs> um, Maori beliefs and practices in relationship to the environment were a really strong um, ground for the research. And um, Maori, I think Maori practices even though I haven't articulated them in this presentation, they're helping me understand working from a more than human um, point of view. So the Māori philosophy um, is um, I am the river and the river is me. So we coexist. This is a, particular, is a particular area, it's a particular um, tribe that has that as their, as their um, philosophy. 
but it's a common frame phrase that you hear a lot in New Zealand. So this idea of um, human coextensiveness with the environment is really key to my um, kaupapa philosophy. Um, Charlotte on the team has done a lot of research looking at ways that you can move between and um, weave together in Māori and Pākehā. Pākehā means like New Zealand European points of view. Um, and like James Cook High School is a has a strong Māori population and so working with those students was really influential for us. Um, yeah, it's one of the key, I'd say Māori philosophy is one of the key grounds from which we work. Maybe I could articulate some of the readings and the bibliography to make that clearer. Um, Carol Brown's dance work, The Blood of Trees, worked really strongly with um, the um, Māori community whose base is that part of the landscape and so she was working with um, a Māori traditional um, sorry, I'm finding because I'm in Portugal and I'm not in New Zealand and some of the words and things come from Māori, ideas are coming to me in Māori and then I'm thinking well I'm in Portugal so um, it's funny when you're in another place that understanding that it's really easy for you in one place doesn't necessarily work as well. But, um, uh, so she was working with, she used this um, story as the whole tapestry to create her choreography and work with the local iwi which is like try a reason to um, generate this performance work. Um, yeah. I, I thought, sorry, um, I may be wrong, it's like I remember it's something from a few years ago, it wasn't there also a geographical issue with Auckland where the sewage went off or into the, into the ocean was also a sacred area. <laughs> there was sort of a physical um, building of the city and planning that didn't take it into account the Maori visions of that territory. I don't know if you had to deal with that in the project or this is um, so there's, so on the political, yeah, on the political level, um, there are huge legal issues to do with Māori ownership of water. Like, um, I could, <laughs> that's a whole other thing, yeah. But um, and we definitely looked at that. Yeah, we took we're looking at the Manukau Harbour. So there's two harbours in Auckland. There's the um, Waitemata. And, and the Monaco. And the Waitemata is like um, the beautiful harbour that we show to the tourists that is very blue and sparkling and um, that's always the side we show. And then the Monaco is the side that often is treated like, um, like um, that we throw things into, that we pollute, that the industry yeah. pours waste into and that is hidden. And so we deliberately, because we performed the first version of the work on the Waitemata harbour, we deliberately wanted to work with the Monaco Harbour for the second version. We wanted to work with the school that was near the Waitemata Harbour so that we were giving both harbours a voice. And the Waitemata Harbour is where the sewage treatment state treatment station is. And there is an island off the coast that is um, a sacred Māori site that, um, that is con a contested site. Um, and there's a lot of issues to do with the sewage treatment station that are really political and quite charged. But we, it's really also really difficult to talk about those issues because there's so many different voices. Um, and again, when you're connected with the university, um, it's if you take one side or another side, then it becomes problematic. And so we really um, we sort of talked more about particular. key water issues that are relevant to the wide general public of Auckland and then we tried to create spaces where people, anybody, could articulate the issues specific to them and share stories specific to them so that then it really allowed us a place to listen to people and present back people's voices through the postcards and through the, um, the vessel of stories. Yeah. But again, um, the project, you know, when you do a project like this, a public art installation, and water issues can be extremely technical and political, and then there's all those issues to do with, um, you know, clean water is something that the entire city depends on, so the council was making some really difficult decisions. And, you, and once you start getting involved in who's right, it's a very difficult. So um, we really want to open up spaces for people to debate 
those issues and to open up as much space for all voices to be heard and not necessarily to um, take a stance from one way or the other, but to say it's really important that as many voices are heard as possible and that the Manukau Harbour has as much of a voice as the Waitemata Harbour. Yeah. <laughs> We have another question about what was on the postcards? What kind of messages did you receive from the public? Um, we got a really wide diversity of messages. So we had, um, you know, people had really specific issues that were really dear to their hearts to do with, I mean, it was in summer and um, we had this problem that when it rains, the um, heavy metals from the cars on the motorways because we're a really busy motorway sort of driving city. So the, the roads were leaching heavy metals, toxic metals into the ocean so that when it rains people are told not to swim in the harbour and they shut down some beaches after a rain. And it's, yeah, a lot of scientists say, yeah, really don't swim in the day of rain or the day after a heavy rain. Um, so people, that was something that was quite common, we need our beaches to be clean, we need to know we can take our children to swim in the beach. Um, and a lot of people saying, you know, when I was a child this river was full of life and now it's dying. Um, looking after, you know, you got really strong general messages like looking after our waterways should be number one. Some of my favourite ones were the ones where you had grandparents and grandchildren together so that you had the child like doing a picture of water from their point of view, like an abstract picture from a kid's point of view, which often, it's like often as adults we draw water, we draw like the water here and the sun up here and the water from a kid's point of view, the water goes all the way to the top of the postcard so it's like you see the water high up. Um, and some beautiful sort of poetic fragments from kids' point of view. I really love capturing kids' voices because it talks about the next generation and, you know, the future of this. It's not just now, it's really in the long term, especially for those of us that are parents. And then the grandparents next to that, and the kind of spidery writing talking about the history of place um, was, I thought, carried real resonance for me. Um, so we had a lot of drawings and maps, we've had a lot. Another one was when I did the work down, um, we did a version in New Plymouth in New Zealand down by a river and I took the postcards down to the children who were watching the eels and some children were drawing eels and one little girl held up her postcard she'd been drawing. She was she had a postcard and they said, um, oh, you'll, we shouldn't be feeding our postcard to the eels, the eels don't, don't eat postcards and she looked at me like I was stupid and I went, are you showing your postcard to the eel? And she said, yes. The eel said, that's a beautiful picture. Uh, thank you for your beautiful picture of me. And I love that idea that you could, you know, show your art to the eels and that the eels would be looking at it and appreciating it. Um, so yeah, we had some really, um, instead when we've done the work, when we did this work in a very specific place by this river, um, the, the really large um, indigenous New Zealand eel um, is very, present there so there was lots of stuff about the eel and um, the way that the eel moves describing the eel children talking about the the way the games that eels like to play so um yeah we i mean we've had hundreds of the postcards so um and they go from everything to the very like there should be more public toilets because i can never find them <laughs> to like the really important specific issues to those um intangible things of memories of place so yeah that's yeah. had so many things. I just you mentioned River. Is that the, the little book? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking one of the interesting things with this project is that it's been a series of projects. It's been a stream, but it's been one few, and then you've taken it on the road. Yeah, so this was an artist residency that I did with Charlotte Shunda. Um, and we were looking at um, not Auckland, we were looking at New Plymouth and the Taranaki region, which is where the in the southern part of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and so there we looked at um, stories. So there we, we couldn't take the whole vessel, like the whole artistic installation, so we just took buckets. And we had buckets of um, writing, buckets of images, and buckets of um, stories. And so people could sit on a bucket and put on the headphones and hear stories specifically related to that area um, and the area around it. And then they could. We, um, we made these river books so that multiple people could read the book at the same time. And uh, I wrote this kind of poem that I'd taken from reading local newspapers and talking to local researchers, um, which made a kind of abstract poem, like a found poem, out of um, out of all the different voices of water. Um, 
and then we have images from uh, from the from the area. So this is one little version of the project where we kind of condensed it so that we could take it on the road. <laughs> so now I think Fluid City isn't necessarily the architectural installations. It can have various different iterations depending on um, the constraints and the possibility of particular times and places and peoples. Yeah. Great. Okay. We were saying we have a water museum here, so we'll oh, for a walk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for a visit, we might have something we can do. But, yeah. um, again, I'd like to thank you so much so for nice. all of your energy <laughs> and for launching the e-seminar series and for everyone who's attended and for those out there somewhere. <laughs> um, and we also, we asked um, at the beginning, for those that do visit the website or, or, or visit the video of the seminar, if you could leave a note underneath or send us an email um, to let us know where you're watching from, that would be great because we'd like to know how far this is reaching. And if you'd like more information on, the, on this project or the overall project, um, oh, let's see, uh, please visit the website. The easiest thing is to search culturizing sustainable cities and it's at the site is at www.ces.uc.pt so Sesh University of Pimbra, Portugal uh, slash projectos culturizing. <laughs> So that's it. We'll get straight away. Let's look it up on the end. We'll put all the YouTube links so that you can see it. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to link it everywhere. So, yeah, that's it for today. And okay. thank you so much. I can't oh. wish you flowers. Actually, I thought of that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Have a good yeah. weekend, Have everybody. Good weekend. <laughs>